These are the gloved hands of Robin Lane, the best teenage magician in the world. What is your name, please? My name is Robin Lane. My name is Robin Lane. My name is Robin Lane. Only one of these young people is the real Robin Lane. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Orson Bean, and Kitty Carlisle on To Tell the Truth. To Tell the Truth is brought to you this evening by Eastman Kodak Company, whose newest instant loading Instamatic cameras make colorful picture taking easier than ever and make perfect gifts for every occasion. And here is your host, Bud Collier. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome once again to To Tell the Truth. Good evening, panel. Good, Good evening, evening Bud. I tell you the best looking and the smartest panel in the whole shooting match. Open up your envelope and follow along with this first story with me, if you will. I, Robin Lane, am a college student. In my spare time, I work as a magician. I performed my first trick when I was 10 years old. I always work alone, never utter a word, and my specialty is manipulating playing cards while wearing gloves in the style of the great Cardini. I also am one of the few magicians who does the unique dancing cane trick. At a joint convention, the Society of American Magicians and the International Brotherhood of Magicians awarded me the title of the best teenage magician in the world. Signed, Robin Lane. Apparently, three young persons all claim to be Robin Lane, and we'll start the questioning, if we may, with Orson B. Orson? Thank you. Uh, number one, in the, uh, the linking rings, I was an early prestidigitator, number one, uh, forever fumbling the billiard ball. How many, in the linking rings, how many, uh, how many uh, rings have a, uh, how many rings are single in the linking rings? I believe there's eight. And they're all single? Uh, actually, I mean? Well, that's the way it's presented. Right. Now, how is it actually? I couldn't tell you that. All right. Number three, name three magicians called Harry. Harry Lorraine, Harry Houdini, Harry Blackstone. Number two, uh, what are you, Houdini, if, uh, or, or rather Cardini, what is his first name? Uh, Richard. Richard Cardini. Uh, no, Richard Pidwick. Richard Pidwick? Mm. Well, wh wh what's, his, what's the first actual professional name that he uses together with Cardini? What as far Cardini? as I know, just Cardini. Not Irving Cardini? <laughs> Sam Cardini, perhaps? Kitty Carlisle. Number three, um, are you a, are you a, a graduate of, of school already? No, I'm You're still not. in school. How much time do you practice? On the weekends, after school for a while. Is that enough? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, where did, do you buy any of your tricks? Uh, yes, I do. Where does one buy magician's tricks? Well, some of them I buy at Alfonso yes. or Lutan at several shops in New York. But Thank you. Uh, Number one, uh, what was Houdini's most famous sort of trademark? His escape. Escape? Right. Thank you. Tom Poston. Uh, Number one, the, uh, I hear that the muscles in the palm of the hand can be trained to retain things, even though your hands are apparently out like that. Do you, do you believe that's true, or do you know it's true? To a certain extent, yes. Well, number two, uh, I, I never was able to figure out any way to get the muscles in the palm of my hand to do that. Do you, have you ever seen anything like that? Uh, if you mean palming, I guess you need well, more practice. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Number two, can, you, uh, number three, so I'm sorry, number two. Number three, you, ha you learn an awful lot of techniques in, in prestidigitation, do you not? Yes. Have you found that the techniques you learn in magic ca can be used in other walks of life? For instance, music. I was wondering if, for instance, you could... Well, I don't know very much about music, so... Well, Peggy Cat. Thank you. Number two, how did you get started as a magi magician? Well, I was always interested in numbers and cards, and uh, I started reading books, and then I started sending away some material, and I was fortunate to have, you know, people that I knew were in it. Thank you. Well, number three, if you opened up just a plain deck of bicycle cards, could you really shuffle them and make them work while you're wearing gloves? I've done it. I couldn't make them work with my bare hands. <laughs> Tell me, number one, do you appear professionally at all? 
Pardon me? Do you appear professionally? Yes, I do. Like where? That's it. Time for you now to do your own prestidigitation on those ballots. So do it at once. Without change once you've marked and without any consultation at all. Spirit writing, if you will, but mark your ballots. Mark them for number one, number two, or number three. The team of challengers will, of course, receive $250 for every incorrect vote. Ballots are all marked, I see. So, Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number one. I'm a great admirer of uh, uh, magic and magic act, magicians and so forth. But he has lovely, long, lean, slender fingers. And I just find it difficult to believe that number two would work without opening her mouth. <laughs> That's what it says here. And she's an awful pretty girl, and pretty girls talk more than that. Peggy Cat. Well, I voted for number two. This season, Robin is a boy's name because of that Batman, but I really think that it's a girl named Robin, and so I voted for two. Arson Bean. You're all nuts. That's number three. <laughs> I was sorry. That's one of my uh, more <laughs> splendid <laughs> ones. I was able to work it out in such detail because I started voting the minute I was through asking. Uh, number one, the linking rings are not eight separate linking rings, even though they appear to be. And number two, Cardini's name is Tony Cardini, so it's number three. Also, he has the eyes of a magician. I'm not going Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number two because she's the prettiest of the three. <laughs> There's a woman's reason for you. Very well, the votes are all in and the minds are made up, as you heard, and the reason's given. We'll find out now how close to the truth we've come as you learn which of these young persons in truth is Robin Lane. Will the real Robin Lane please stand up? <laughs> Robin has gone to perform some of his tricks for us. So while he's getting ready, let's uh, meet our two uh, imposters here. First, the pretty one. What is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Gloria Summer, and I teach mathematics in Saddlebrook High School in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> There's one of your students who's going to get an A this year. <laughs> Number three, what is your real name and what do you do, sir? My name is Jerry Lane, and I'm on the production staff of another Goodson Todman show, The Match Game. <laughs> <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, to tell the truth is proud to present the best teenage magician in the world, Robin Lane. Thank you very, very much. That really was a fine performance, and we indeed do thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> One left over. I love the way you use this meme technique. I think it's marvelous. Yes, yes. Yeah, I never saw that before. Very skillfully done, I must say. Well, ladies, lady and gentlemen, checking the score, you all did very well. You fooled to the extent of three incorrect votes, and that means three times $250 for a total of... $750 you take along with you, along with our best wishes and hopes you had as good a time as you gave us. Good night, and God bless you. <laughs> now may I present our next team of challengers.
What is your name, please? My name is Greville Wynn. My name is Greville Wynn. My name is Greville Wynn. Please follow along with your copies of this one, if you will, panel. I, Greville Wynn, was a British intelligence agent during World War II. In 1957, I was asked to go to the Soviet Union and once again act as a British agent. Posing as a businessman, it was my job to contact Oleg Pankovsky, a high-ranking Soviet intelligence officer who had expressed a desire to supply to the West invaluable top-secret information. Working together, we were able to spirit out of the Soviet Union over 8,000 important documents, letters, and photographs. They exposed the activities of communist spies throughout the world and caused the dismissal not only of the chief of Soviet intelligence, but also of Nikita Khrushchev himself. One of the crucial pieces of information I learned from Penkovsky concerned the proposed Soviet missile buildup in Cuba. Armed with our knowledge of how far the Russians were prepared to go, President Kennedy was able to stand his ground against Premier Khrushchev. There is no doubt that the secret information Penkovsky gave to me was a determining factor in preventing World War III. Signed, Greville Wynn. <laughs> These three gentlemen all claim to be Greville Wynn. We'll start the cross-examination with Kitty Carlisle. Please. Thank you, Bud. What a marvelous story. Number two, uh, who was Beria? Beria was in charge of the um, military intelligence under Stalin. Thank you. Uh, number three, do you really believe that Penkovsky's revelations toppled uh, Khrushchev? I know it. You do. Uh, number one, who was Abel? Abel, I have not heard of. Uh, have you ever heard of a man called Colonel Abel, number two? Not under that name, but possibly I may have met him. Uh-huh. Uh, number three, what was the Ogpoo called in 1957? Well, that was Barrier's crowd uh, in Stalin's time, but it's been changed since then. What's it called now? In a variety of names, it's still the Ogpoo, in my <laughs> opinion. Uh, number one, what, do you, what is the secret police called? Is the NKVD the same thing? Called the KGB. KDB. Uh, number two, who's... Tom Poston. Sorry, uh, thank you. Number one, please, may I ask, to whom did Penkovsky initially express this desire to supply information? First of all, to the Canadians. Number two, how did he go about doing that without running a terrible risk? Well, there was a trade delegation from Canada to Moscow, and he contacted that delegation, one of the members. Oh, that must have been terrifying. How would he know that he wasn't contacting somebody who was in the pay of some... Number three, uh, do you have any fears for your own personal safety as a result of having been in on this? Well, I think the time has passed. Uh, they missed their opportunity. And my announcements have been announced. Well, number one, you're not going back to Russia soon, I presume. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no. Peggy Cat. Boy, this is really a thriller. Tell me, number two, who was... Sorg, I guess that's the way he's, uh, S-O-R-G-E, do you know who he was? That's exactly how you pronounce it. Oh, I don't know him, Miss mm -hmm. Cat. Oh, well, do you know who he was, number one? No, I've not heard of him. Thank you. Well, number three, who was Oleg P Pankovsky? Well, the uh, best uh, uh, story, um, the best seller in the whole of the world at the moment, and 10,000 copies have been printed in the uh, uh, Soviet Union language, it's called the Pankowski Papers. I suggest you read it. It's oh, well, a bestseller I, in the States. Yeah, but well, uh, I'm sorry I didn't mean to offend you, but number one, I mean, what was his job when he, he was in the, in the Russian government? He, he was in the Russian government, but he was against Khrushchev, and so he wanted to uh, topple him. Is he still alive, number one? No. What, number two, what happened? Yeah. He was shot after the trial. Number three, where is he? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> number three, who wrote the Pankowski Papers? Well, it was a combination of the diaries smuggled out by Pankowski himself before he had being shot. Who compiled it? Uh, compiled them. Uh, they were sent to a Russian deflector called Derry Abin and eventually edited by a man called Frank Gibley. But did I miss the, them this is the be world's bestseller. Surely you've heard of them. Of course I know. I didn't know who wrote it. I thought maybe you did. Uh, I've written the forward to them, yes. But you wrote the forward. Number three, I don't mean to stay on you, but did I misunderstand you? It hasn't been printed in Russia, has it? Oh, 10,000 copies have been sent, uh, printed in Russian, and most of them have found their way there, yes. Uh, uh, black market, underground? Well, sure. Number one, uh, 
why did he do it? Why did he want to turn uh, against communism? Because he felt Khrushchev was, was planning for a third world war, which ah, he was against ah. in principle. Number he two. Was all Russian. That's it. Time for you now to mark your ballot. So mark them, if you will, now, panel, without change, without consultation. Just vote. Vote for number one, number two, or number three. Ballot. All marked. Very well. Tom, for whom did you vote? Well, I voted for number one. Now, there were some things that I knew something about that he didn't seem to know about. But after all, he was supposed to be a businessman. Uh, uh, maybe he knew more about business and, and uh, business relations than he did about spies and spying. If he did his job, well, he wouldn't have to know about other spies, I guess. So I voted for number one. Peggy. Well, I voted for number three because I think his name was Victor Sorge. was a very big Russian spy against the Japanese in World War II, and I, if I know it, and I'm just a plain ordinary person, I think a real spy should know it. Orson. Well, I couldn't, but they were all marvelous. Two great liars, but I couldn't believe that one and two never heard of Abel. Isn't it Rudolph Abel? Colonel Abel. I Colonel, Colonel, yeah, that's right. I couldn't believe one of the most spy. famous Russian spies in the world. He so worked I in Brooklyn. Them. How would they know? They would know. Anybody would know. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. Maybe his name is Albert. Well, I voted for number one, even though he didn't know Colonel Abel, who was, after all, a Russian spy working in America. This is an English. All you've got to do is read the Daily News. Well, but maybe they, doesn't they read the Daily News? And, and number three was a, very, a little truculent, as perhaps a writer might be, but I voted for number one anyway. All right. Be number three. They would have shot him over there right <laughs> there. That leaves it. Two ways, it evenly divided, two for three and two for one. Let's ride with that, shall we, and see how well we work out. And find out now which one of these three gentlemen is indeed Greville Wynn. Will the real Greville Wynn please stand up? Exciting story, believe me. Number one, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Norman Palmer. I'm special representative of Barclays Bank DCO in New York. <laughs> and number two, what is your real name and what do you do, sir? My name is Peter Hallis. I'm vice president of Gordon's Dry Gin Company. <laughs> <laughs> Because the 50% victory over this panel is a mighty good one indeed, believe me. There were two incorrect votes, two times $250, $500, gentlemen. Our sincere thanks to you, and hope you'll look back upon this as a very happy visit. Good night, and God bless you. you. And now, let's meet our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Don Hannon. My name is Don Hannon. My name is Don Hannon. Follow along once again. You have copies there, I believe, panel. I, Don Hannon, am mayor of Griggsville, Illinois. A few years ago, our fair city was infested with millions of insects, mostly mosquitoes. To solve our big bug problem, we turned to our friends, the birds, in particular, the purple martin. The purple martin's diet is strictly flying insects. In fact, a single martin eats its own weight in bugs, 2,000 mosquitoes a day. Furthermore, purple martins love people and prefer to nest in man-made birdhouses. In 1963, we bought 28 birdhouses and set them up along Griggsville's main street. From an original population of some 200 purple martins, we now have over 3,000. 1,000 of them live in a 40-story apartment building strictly for the birds. We call the structure the Empire State Building of the Bird World, and Griggsville has become the Purple Martin capital of the nation. Signed, Don Hannon. Well, panel, these three gentlemen all claim to be, as you heard them claim, Don Hannant. And we will start with Peggy Cass. Peggy? Thank you, bud. And number three, uh, did the Purple Martin sing? Oh, they are, yeah, they have a very lovely voice. Uh, and number one, the color is purple, I take it? Uh, black and purple. Oh, 
Uh, I've never seen a Purple Martin number two. Do they, do they have a Purple Martins in New England and New York? Yes, they do, but primarily they're the Midwest birds. Thank you. Uh, number three, why are these birds so lazy they won't build their own houses? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, they're not lazy. It's just that they're attracted to certain conditions uh, where uh, there are plenty of mosquitoes and insects and that sort of thing. Well, Number two, what I don't understand is why you didn't plug up the pond. Orson Bean. Yes, we, 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 in New York, we only have pigeons, the bums of the bird world walking around. <laughs> Luke Kamen always says, if you can't sing, at least fly. Yeah. Now, number one, uh, are there any problems that have come as a result of all of these lovely purple martins? I mean, how has the, how has the, uh, the statue of the Civil War veteran down on the Griggsville, uh, how has he fared? I'd say it has improved. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Line them up a bit. I say, well, all right. Number two, uh, uh, why don't they do this in New Jersey then? They got mosquitoes and everything over there. They'd better to have purple martins than. Uh... Well, actually, uh, they can do it any place in the uh, Midwest and the South and even in the New England area. Why couldn't we do it here? We can do it. Yeah, well, tell New Jersey about that. They could use Get it, Carlisle. Carl. True. Number three, is it really a whole 40 story house just for birds? It's 40 feet high. It's 40 story, uh, four, uh, 40 houses, actually. You mean for birdhouses? That's right. I see. Number one, where did the purple martin come from? It comes from the uh, south Brazil. Uh-huh. Uh, number two, how large a bird is it? It's about eight inches long and weighs about four ounces. Uh-huh. Uh, number three, when you, uh, d who feeds these birds aside from the, the mosquitoes? What, 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 but the, the mos times when there are no mosquitoes, like in the winter. In the what do you do? Uh, they, they're migratory birds. They go back to Brazil. Oh, and they leave you. And, well, what about the balance of uh, nature? Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tom Poston. Uh, number two, uh, you're not a Hoosier, are you? No, I'm not. Uh, number mm -hmm. three, who, what are Hoosiers? Hoosiers, Indiana. And number one, I'm a Buckeye. What does that make me? Iowa. Well, uh, Number two, what is your, the people of your state called? We're called the Illini, the same as the university. Oh, that's right. Number three, where is the university in Illinois? Do you happen to know? Yes, I do. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, number two, sign we have. Right there. <laughs> so take that, that bit of enlightenment that you got and turn it into a ballot. Mark your ballots, if you will, please, without change, without any consultation. Just vote now for number one, number two, or number three. Oh, uh, Mark, Tom, for whom did you vote this time? Well, I voted for number two. Uh, if, I, if I'm from uh, Iowa, I'll be the first Buckeye that's not from Ohio, so I voted for number two. <laughs> Peggy Cat. Well, I voted for number three. Because he's cute and because he knows that a Hoosier is from Indiana. Orson B. I voted for number two just because he has a jolly twinkle in his eye. <laughs> <laughs> and Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number one because he looks like a politician and I don't know what a Buckeye is. <laughs> <laughs> there we have it. Votes all in. Minds made up. We go right to the truth now and find out what it is as we learn which of these three gentlemen in truth is Don Hannant. Will the real Don Hannant please stand up. <laughs> Indeed it does. Well, Don't do any politicking in Ohio. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm sorry, Tom. Are you Tom. sharing this idea with other mayors of other towns that may have a problem? Yes, sir, we are. It is successful, isn't yes, it? Yes, sir, very successful. Great idea. Are the mosquitoes gone now? And that's what you're talking about. It doesn't destroy the balance of nature, yes, either. Yes. But where, where did the bugs come from originally? Where did they New come Jersey. from originally? Well, they're, <laughs> they're, they're just naturally there. And then you, uh, with uh, using these purple martins, then you don't have to use pesticides or insecticides. Great idea. So wonderful idea. Just great. Number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Phil Walsh, and I'm the manager of the observatory of the Empire State Building. <laughs> <laughs> the real Empire State Building. Number three, what is your real name, sir, and what do you do? My name is Lou Jennings. I'm manager of H. Hicks and Son Fruit Shop and Soda Fountain in New York. Oh, yeah. Checking the story, we find it extremely well. He really split the vote high, wide, and handsome and uh, trapped them into three incorrect votes. Same as the first round tonight at three times $250. Total, therefore, of course, $750. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Good night, and God bless you.
And that's all we have time for. Panel, good night to you, and thank you for another night, happy, nice evening thank for me. You. Good night, bud. And see you tomorrow, of course. Thank you, too. We'll see you next week. See you tomorrow afternoon in the daytime show. But in the meantime, don't you forget to tell the truth. Good night. To tell the truth is a Mark Goodson, Bill Cotton introduction. To tell the truth has been brought to you by... Stay tuned now as Steve Allen welcomes celebrity guest Hugh O'Brien for what promises to be a rousing session on I've Got a Secret, next. <laughs> Tell the truth has been brought to you by Clarol, creators of the exciting natural look and beauty. And tonight, by Loving Care, the hair color lotion that washes away only the gray. This program was pre-recorded. <laughs>